Welcome everybody to this startup, the SG Virtual Startup Grind in uh, December, the first one. And I'm very pleased to have Klaus with us today, who has a wealth of experience, but also uh, nonetheless, he is a fellow Startup Grind chapter director and has a very close link with Luxembourg. Hi, Klaus. Hi, Stephen, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, a lifelong entrepreneur, been venture building for over 30 years, um, but and it has been part of the startup grind community for, I guess, well, almost five, six years ago. Um, I founded the uh, chapter in Madrid when I lived there, and I have later moved on and live in Lisbon, uh, but I still stay connected. It's it's an amazing community. It's a, it's a wealth of information and networks and everything, so you don't want to leave. That's right. So just in a little bit in a nutshell, how did you arrive into Luxembourg? I mean, uh, what are you actually doing? What, let's say, what is the link with Luxembourg, to your actual link for the time being? So the, the actual link actually goes back uh, more than 10 years. So I've, I've been going to Luxembourg for the past 10 years. Um, and it's a funny little story. So uh, during some sabbatical years, I took, I sold some companies and I took some sabbatical years. I um, I met an investor, I met an angel investor, and he was based in Luxembourg. And, and just from our interactions at uh, that time, he said, well, listen, whatever you want to do next, um, I'm going to write you the check. So uh, we sort of got connected. He invested in, in my startup. And since then, you know, we have been friends. I have been an advisor to him investing. I have been a coach to his founders and, and helped uh, his sort of portfolio. He has about uh, six companies that he has angel funded. So I've been coming to Luxembourg for the past 10 years. Uh, it's a fantastic, great little uh, city, but big little city uh, in the sense that, you know, Luxembourg punches so much above its weight class when you're looking at the uh, inhabitants, uh, the number of people, etc. So a uh, fantastic place. I have loved it. and. Um, so one of the investments that I advised this angel to fund um, was two Frenchmen doing research and development on lossless data compression. Mm -hmm. So we are talking deep tech here. Uh, and these two French founders simply needed um, their burn rate, their you know, monthly expenditures to, to do their uh, research and, and build the product. So um, and this angel has been investing in this for the past five years. And, um, you know, alongside, I have been meeting with the founders. We have even traveled to, to Seattle to meet at Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, together. So this spring, uh, January, we had a product ready. And uh, the founders and the angel pointed to me, the CEO, um, because this is really my wheelhouse, so to speak. You know, the first 36 months of a company, this is really where I have my competency, um, hiring a team, raising money, getting the first clients on board, getting the vision across, you know, getting there to tell the world what we want to do. So um, since January this year, I've been CEO of Setaco. Uh, it's a Luxembourgish uh, company based in Luxembourg, uh, registered there. and. But due to COVID, you know, the team is still distributed and uh, we have very little substance and presence right now. We have an office at Loft um, mm. and I, I look forward to getting back to the ecosystem and the people and I look forward to hiring a team and having them sit there. Uh, but it's just not been possible, as you can uh, understand. So um, we are actually proud of rolling out a deep tech company from Luxembourg at the heart of Europe. Mm -hmm. Let if we rewind a little bit, uh, going back because you just uh, mentioned that you got out of a, a few companies or businesses, and then you got into contact with this uh, high net worth, net worth individual and so on. What are these businesses? How did they came about, or how did you initially start one or one or the other of these businesses? How did it come about? Okay, so um, first of all, I, I am uh, born in a family of entrepreneurs. My parents were entrepreneurs. My, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. So uh, in the ratio between nature and nurture, um, 
I think that uh, these things place, you know, equally 50-50. So I was born into entrepreneurship and I saw entrepreneurship right away. Um, I don't have a, even a high school degree, uh, weird as it may sound, but I went left school quite early. Um, from the grade, I uh, had a plan to get into my father's business. Um, but after a few years, my father actually decided to sell the business. And um, that was, I was, you know, early 20s. And, and that sort of kicked start a bit like, yeah, I want to do my own thing because, you know, this is what I had seen and what I wanted to do. Um, so my very first startup was actually at the age of, I think, 25, uh, 26. Um, and this was in the early days of European Union's free movement of goods. You know, nobody knows this today, but before that, you had not a free movement of goods. Uh, it, mean, it meant that a, a brand owner could claim that we are the only one allowed to be selling Unilever or Nestle products and stuff like that in this country. But that had opened up and uh, a lot of supermarket change and people were not aware that, you know, what impact this had. So I established a, um, a trading company, international trading company in branded consumer goods. And uh, we were selling Palmolive, all of those branded articles into, into Denmark, primarily in the beginning. But then as it developed, we started to sell this all over Europe and, and we became maybe one of the top five trading companies in Europe, sending goods across borders, you know, even buying in Germany, selling to England and buying in Spain and selling to Germany and etc. So uh, this was a, an opportunity created by government legislation. It was a market that didn't exist a few years before and, and I saw that opportunity. Um, and I think that is, you know, one of the ways that entrepreneurs develop themselves. It, either it is uh, solving a problem, maybe they solve the problem that they had and they said, hmm, maybe other people have the same problem or market conditions and change, things changes. So it creates a market. Um, you know, a lot of people have now established business on, uh, you know, PPE, you know, personal protecting equipment, you know, that was a market that didn't exist exactly 12 months ago. Well, it existed, but it was not of this scope and scale. Um, so I think as an entrepreneur, you are, you have to have your mind open and mind, eyes and ears open on, on what's happening around you and diving into the problems you can solve. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that experience with, with, uh, with my companies, it was then, you know, further on, I, I had established those company uh, that I sold. Um, and that again was a bit of, um, you know, the path you follow. Um, I, um, I had my trading company at, at some point we started selling food into to Russia. Um, and this is then 94, 95, uh, again, a long time ago, <laughs> speaking here, 2020. Um, but at that time you could sell a lot of things into Russia. The market had just opened up more or less. So the market was, you know, yawning for everything. And we started selling Danish salamis, something um, as classic as that. But, you know, um, it became a big business and we sold, you know, hundreds of tons of salami into Russia. That that then made me go to Russia and to have our office there and on, a, on a, you know, five monthly travel trips, I would meet business people and I would... Uh, you know, sit around and talking uh, what was going on. And and in one of those conversations, there was a big um, real estate company called Heinz, uh, not with the E Z I catch you, but I N E S from, from Houston in Texas. And it's actually the world's largest property management company. And um, they had really, really high quality class A properties, you know, in Moscow, you know, glass, steel, marble, and they charged a lot of money. But, you know, you know, we were sitting there over chicken wings and beer in, in, a, in a diner in Moscow. And he said, but, you know, Klaus, I, can, I cannot get the service level I want. I, I can, you know, I have complaints every week. You know, we have clients like Sony and Motorola and, and you know, JP Morgan and all these top playing clients. And, and they are our clients in Hong Kong and in, in Paris and in New York. But in Moscow, we always get complaints. So again, as that entrepreneur, you, you see someone having an, an issue and a problem and you say, so I, I actually turned around to him and said, so 
if I make you a cleaning company that provides the service that you're used to in Paris, New York, and, and Hong Kong, would you buy from me? And he said, I have no other choice. I have tried everything. Nobody can, nobody gets it. Nobody gets service levels and, you know, facility services. So that triggered me to go back to Denmark to get the Danish vocational training system. We have a vocational training system that educates cleaners. So it was a three week program. And uh, I said, okay, I don't have three weeks. I want to move a little bit faster. So what can we cut out of that? And there was a whole week on, on ergonomics. So I said, okay, Guys, we, we're not going to spend, you know, 10 days on talking economics. We are just starting out in Moscow. Um, so I got the first 20 uh, sort of teach the teachers. So I had 20 cleaners that were able to teach these skills to, to, um, to employees. And uh, I think we were then in um, April 97, um, I launched... A, 96 and 97, I can't really remember now. We, we launched a, a fully fledged cleaning company and we signed on one of those buildings that this gentleman had complained about uh, that he could not have the level that he wanted. And, and we ended up having all their buildings in Moscow. We ended up having all IKEA. IKEA came to the country and IKEA, of course, also had high standards. So being a sort of a foreign company with, with uh, with a foreigner client, you know, we, we got into IKEA and we ended up having all IKEAs across Russia. So that company really took off. But one day when I met this gentleman from Heinz, I said to him, how come you decided to take me as a supplier to your most prestigious building in town? It, I mean, they were charging a thousand dollars a square meter in rent, okay? Uh, the building was brand new, it was just opened and no one has. So how come you took me to supply you there when I had no track record? And he just said to me, Klaus, I knew that you might not uh, make get it right, but you would make it right. Meaning, yes, you will come in and you will fail in certain instances, but if I pick up the phone, you will pick it up, you will listen to me, you will fix it next day. So you might not make it right in the first instance, but you will get it right. So you would have that attitude of, you know, customer is the king, you know, all these things, you know, focus on service. And he said, and that's just all I want. You know, I, I just want someone to listen to us and then, you know, fix what has gone wrong and then move on. Um, and I think that's also a good lesson for for entrepreneurs, you know, in, uh, you know, listen to your clients. You, we have heard it so many things, but here I actually got a client just from portraying that we listen to clients. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, if you look a little bit back, I mean, they have, they have different businesses and different kinds of businesses under different conditions. Okay, you came from the family business and then you started on your own. Um, had you, when you first started on your own, had you some support or mentor like, or uh, how was it? Because I can imagine that at that time you were not so cocooned like uh, uh, many entrepreneurs are nowadays. I mean, you have so many assistance schemes around in every country. So, how, what? How did you go about it? What was a little bit the harder thing, uh, if you look back? I, I fully agree with you, Stephen. It's, it's a dream to be an entrepreneur today. It is, it is, um, it's the best time to be an entrepreneur. It's the best time to start out there. There's so many support teams, accelerators, incubators, coaches, startup grind communities, so many things that, that was not available in 93 when, when I started my first company. And, um, I did not get uh, that much support in the sense that uh, my parents, of course, were busy running their business. So what I you know, agreed with my dad was that I would sit on the opposite side of his table and then I would turn the phone and then I would use the phone and I would call out and, uh, and try to reach clients and get a deal. And when he came into his office, I would turn the phone back so that he could make his phone calls. And um, and I also moved back to my parents so that I could save on my uh, my cost and sort of, you know, being fed again by my mom. So 
and and of course that's not ideal when you are 25 you know to go back and live with your parents um, but it was a sacrifice that i wanted to and they were you know of course welcoming me back i'm, I'm sure it was not great for them either you know having their a grown-up son but it was only for a year or something that i lived at home um Mm-hmm. And uh, and and got you know uh, food by my parents and allowed to borrow my my dad's um, phone and um, and I think it was um, you know I got the support in the sense that they they would know how hard it is and the things that I was going through but other than that you know um, it was not like my dad could could sort of you know give me much coaching in what i was supposed to do other than just keep grinding and and actually uh, my pa- my dad has passed away now and, and one of the things that i realized that he he taught me and he he always you know and it's a saying here nothing comes from doing nothing mm-hmm. and it's a uh, you know very simple he had a little uh, a little um, mirror frame a little frame on his table with that little cutting out and little thing and he gave it to me and then i it's just so clear today, you know, you, you got to take 10x action, you know, if, to use one of those, you know, modern terms, but nothing comes from doing nothing. So you just keep grinding, keep moving forward. And I think that would be the, been the best lesson that he has learned to me. And so far, um, in the most of the businesses, you ever been on your own or did you have partners uh, in the ventures? I mean, who were on, among with you either for their skills or other things how was that part um you can't do it alone doesn't really matter what kind of business so back in those days when it was uh, a trading company i i quickly found people that had the same skill sets like me Uh, when it was a cleaning company i had to find people that had done it before I had never done a cleaning company before, so I, I hired people from ISS. You know, I simply went out, pitched them a, a great opportunity, and and gave them access to uh, a bit on the upside on equities, etc. And they joined me. Um, later on, in technology companies, like um, I have been involved in again the same thing. Uh, Complement your own skills. Uh, mm-hmm. Find find someone to take the blind spots. Um, and, and as I said, I don't have much education, so I'm, I'm very a generalist. You know, I, I know a little bit of everything, uh, more or less. Um, and that's great in the beginning, and in, especially in the beginning, you need to be a few generalists so that you, you know a bit more. Um, but you know, certain focus areas will develop as you, as you go along. I, I always say um, you have to surround yourself early on in the team with people that can that knows more about other things than you. Um, it's very, very crucial. Mm-hmm. And very often um, when you s- start your business and uh, you have a young business, a small, you're a small company, you're getting the traction, you are getting the first customers, paying customers, as of course. Um, how difficult was it to manage this growth either in financial terms, either in managing the expectations of your clients or the getting the resources by resources, not only the financial resources, but also the human resources, the logistical resources, uh, the operational resources to enable your business to move on, to develop. How did you address these parts all together with your partners? Or what did they come um, uh, no, he, <laughs> no, he, yeah, no, nothing. Uh, as a CEO, you have a few things you need constantly to do. Um, one is, you know, invest the relationship. You need to be on top of um, you're speaking with your investors and making sure. Uh, second part is, of course, the team and the company and the culture and the building and, and reinforcing the vision. And one third thing that is, it's almost you know one third of what you need to do as a CEO. That is constantly being on the outlook to hire. You always need to be networking, meeting people, talking to people in in your field and in your competitor, etc. So that when you need to grow and you can grow, you have almost you know a short list of people that you have engaged with that know you. That is maybe you know 
keeping an eye on what you are doing, et cetera. So one of those really three or four fundamental pillars that a CEO uh, of a startup needs to do is constantly being out there to, to attract talent. Um, as again, you know, we need to be a, a group of people to get uh, a company far. Mm-hmm. And then there is the, the thing of, of growth uh, and also getting funding. Um, and I personally had a, a great lesson in that. Uh, we had a startup where we, and I say this today, I think almost prematurely got funded too much. And then the startup was a great technology startup, uh, uh, allowing small businesses to use Facebook as their operational platform, like, you know, the, the front and back end of their small hairdresser salon or fitness studio or whatever. And, and we had great traction with Facebook and, and suddenly we closed um, 11 million euros in funding. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and of course, we were excited and we were thrilled that a VC, you know, um, saw that as an opportunity and invested so much in us. But some of the missteps that we did was that we then grew too fast. Um, we sort of, you know, our head came a, a little bit too high. You know, we thought, wow, you know, with this, we can really crank up the burn rate and we can really hire a lot of people and we can really go to a new market very fast. And, um, and the organization was not ready for that. Um, I did not have um, a good enough bench, so to speak. You know, my, my bench was made up of my co-founders, but that had been great at that very early startup level. But managing a company suddenly with 30 plus employees and, and you know, millions, you know, access to millions in funding, it was, they, they had not worked uh, enough experience to know how to deal with these things. So. Mm-hmm. Actually, too much funding at that stage actually, you know, hurt us in, in a way. Um, and, and managing growth is uh, is the ability to to stay humble and to keep your head down and and stick to your your roadmap and your plans. Um, of course, turned up a little bit as as funding comes in, but you know, we we took a little bit of a leapfrog over some steps we we should have not missed. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, looking a little bit at the markets, I mean, you really operated in various markets, uh, not only geographically, but how, how did you go, what would you eventually say uh, was an enabling factor for yourself or some of the businesses? Was it that you had some genius Loki? that you knew people on the ground, that eventually you had some affinity with the vertical you were in? Because, I mean, as you explained, you really went to something which you had, between quotation mark, excuse me, the, uh, the word, no clue about. So, and, and then it was even in a different geographical market. How did you go about it? Because that's, I could imagine that that's even a further hurdle or a further constraint in the, because you have the accept you have the exception and you don't know the rules of the games of these markets. Correct. Um, getting getting traction anywhere or with anything um, goes back to a very simple thing of of having a product that solves. You know solutions and and things sort of starts to take off a little bit on their own it's you know uh, that is one thing you you of course need to deliver uh, on your uh, your expectations to your clients so if the product in itself is good and it delivers value that in itself is some sort of a flywheel effect you know that you set into motion then on the on the on the more human side and networking sides this is again you know making sure that it is an activity that you do that that you do uh, meet your clients you do get out there you do meet your com- maybe competitors even you do go to events you do show yourself you show up and, and and tell your story and meet people that then maybe wants to join you or you will promote you in front of somebody else that could be interesting so um there's not you know one thing that uh, needs to be done it's a combination of things 
but you have to remember that um and i i like also when you when in your interview uh, when you, in your invitation you take taking huge risks i don't see it that way i i know there is a risk element and the more financial risk element and, and things that you need to address but risk for me is it it goes back to where people say, you know, you have a plan A and you, you know, if, if you are a, a young girl and you love baking and you, you say to your parents, listen, I want to be a baker and I want to open my own muffin store and this is really what I have a passion for. And then the time comes around 16, 18 that, you know, your parents will start to guide you on your career and they will say, listen, there's a lot of bakers without a job. There's a lot of bakers that don't make it, you know, and and none of our family has ever had their own business. So this plan B is being introduced where you, why don't you become a marketeer in a big FMCG company or in a bank or, you know, so plan A becomes uh, not the primary plan, but it's a plan B and, and these little girls, you know, will say, okay, then I can always bake in my spare time and, and goes for a plan B that has been portrayed as more safe and secure. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think the biggest lie and the biggest falsehood is because nothing is safe, nothing is secure. And we can see this now, you know, millions of people have been laid off in secure jobs in marketing and banking, et cetera, et cetera. But when you go down path A, which is the path you have passion for and that you want to do, you're also going to encounter obstacles and difficulties but you are working in a realm of something that you have a passion for, something you want to exploit and you want to find out more. So you try, you, you will solve it as you go along. So the further you go down this path, the more you will know, the more people you would get introduced to. And, and sort of this path will compile itself and, and compound itself and you will actually start moving up a ladder that you have created yourself. Whereas the other one you are totally dependent on someone else and it's not more safe and it's not more secure and then coming now to the exits how did you go about it i mean when did you feel that it was time to do something else or to get out of it was it just pure opportunity at that moment or was it okay but um, uh, my heart is not there anymore or I may be, I'm not the right person to move the venture to the next through the next steps or is it maybe that you had something else somewhere? Uh, how did, was it about? Because that's also something which is interesting. Yeah, the, the, the first exit um, that I did was of a distribution company I had in Russia. So um, there's a very big manufacturer of vacuum cleaners. It's called Nilfisk. It's a Danish brand. I maybe you know it yourself. It's, it's worldwide. It's one of the best in the world. And and actually, Nilfisk had come to me and asked if I could do the distribution in Russia for them because I had this cleaning company, so I was somehow related. So I had ended up setting up a distribution for Nilfisk. And and a few years later, it it did really really well. Actually, we were the second fastest growing market for Nilfisk uh, after Australia. And Nilfisk sort of came to me and said, congratulations, Klaus, it's going amazing. We really need to turn up the volume. And um, I don't know, I must have been maybe 30, 30 plus something, I can't remember. And I had already, you know, two other companies. So I was, you know, constantly stretched for cash. So I didn't, you know, it was a 50-50 partnership with Nilfisk. So they wanted to invest a million euros to really the 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 market penetration of Nilfisk in Russia and and I didn't have that half a million because you know yes I had assets and I had employees and I had a growing cleaning company etc but I didn't have free cash I didn't have that much cash so I said well then you better buy me out so so in that case it was you know a success but you know it was a bit David Guy and Goliath, you know, they were very big and had all the funding in the world and I was very small, but I had worked hard and to get to where we were and they wanted to do more. So I saw it better for me to, to step away and then let them run with it. And it's today, you know, a very, very big um, uh, place for, for Neil Fisk selling their machines. Um, the other one, uh, when I actually sold that cleaning company and we are still staying in a little bit some years back here, but that was 
purely personal. Um, I had uh, met my ex-wife, uh, my wife at the time, and uh, and thought maybe it was time to to change my life dynamics a bit. You know, maybe to to have a child. You know, I, I had really focused a lot on on building companies, and those were my children. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I it gave me a lot of opportunities. But I've never had a family as such. Um, so there I picked up the phone and I rang the CEO of ISS, uh, the world's largest uh, facility service company, and uh, got the CEO on the phone and gave him my five minutes pitch. And uh, he said, come to Denmark and we talk about it. And, uh, and that deal was done very, very quick uh, because they wanted to get into Russia. I had the right composition of clients, international clients, clients that they even knew from other markets, etc. So. It was a really good stepping stone for them to get into, but again, it was circumstances that led me to 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 relinquish what I had. Mm -hmm. But I think um, today in technology, I don't think you know really the founders today sort of leave a company like I did it with those physical companies because technology companies they are very much you know in, and very often an embedded. Uh, part of the founders. So even if it becomes very big, the founders are either chairman of the board or but they stay vested with their shares, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They they rarely, I mean, Bill Gates just recently relinquished everything, you know, but he's still a uh, shareholder and he's still a board member and etc. So I don't think that you really leave uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. And now coming a little bit to the future, if now with uh, your new venture, which is uh, in Luxembourg, uh, how would you like to see it develop? If you could express a wish, how would you like it to see it develop? What could be the next levels or steps with uh, that company? So, so this is a really, really interesting company. And I, I, as I said, I have been starting maybe more than 10 companies in my life, uh, if not more, maybe, but at least 10 uh, large scale companies. And, and this is by far the most interesting and impactful company that I have uh, started. Um, and, and the reason why it's so impactful being such a boring topic as deep tech and lossless compression, it's because the world is standing in front of an explosion in data. Um, we are going, you know, 5x in the next five years. We are we're going from something like 35, 40 uh, setabytes of data to 175 setabytes of data. <clears throat> and this is from 5G, IoT, Industry 4.0 or 2.0, whatever it's called. And, and all of these areas are sort of, you know, expanding, you know, exponentially in data production, transmission and storage. And an algorithm that governs lossless compression today is 40 years old, four decades old. So it's, a, it's from the last millennial, so to speak, also. It's not the even, uh, you know, uh, it's the, the 21st century we're in now. So we wanted to build a compression technology that was future-proofed. Mm -hmm. And what we have done here is that we have built a compression technology that works on the bit level. So it's bit by bit. It doesn't matter what kind of data it is. It doesn't need to chunk data. It doesn't need to. So it has very, very small footprint. It uses very, very little compute power and resources. And that alone allows lossless compression to sit places where it doesn't allow to sit today in IoT devices, in uh, many, many things where you simply cannot install an LZW um, algorithm because it's mm -hmm. one gigabyte of size and it needs compute memory cpu power etc uh, and so you cannot it's simply just not physically allowed whereas now with a 200 kilobyte little file and no use of memory or resources you know you can actually have lost this compression so suddenly you know even on your phone today this could sit in an arm chip you know it's so it's very very fitted for an arm chip so you could actually start handling every data point coming in and out of your phone could be lost as compressed, whereby the files are smaller, we take up less bandwidth, you use less energy on storing it, you lose less energy in computing it, etc. So there's a lot of benefits. Mm -hmm. 
So where I would really like to see this is, um, of course, with some of the design partners we have today to get it installed somewhere and start uh, showing real use cases. Um, but also, and I really glad that we became part of the Fit for Start program because with that, I would hope to get some access to research, development, and innovation grants and funding because there are several components of this algorithm that is not even exploited yet. Uh, something as encryption, you know, the, the data that is being sent compressed with our software is highly, highly encrypted. Um, we need to document that, we need to work on that. Um, so I, I would really like to see further research and development done into the code. I would love to see it embedded in, in, uh, in a wide range of use cases uh, on a very low level uh, so that it can really have an, a compounding impact on data storage, data transmission uh, in the world. Okay, thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, thank you for having played the game for, for this fireside chat. You know them from the other side, so that's it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. okay. uh, there's a question coming in. Uh, in light of COVID and Brexit, where are you seeing changes in talent acquisition and funding? Um, that's actually a good question because uh, there are going to be changes um, with less moving around. Uh, even when we sort of go back to a normal uh, vaccines that roll out and people can jump on planes, I think there will be uh, still a shift. Positive shift in funding is that the old notion of, you know, I stay within 50 kilometers of where I live uh, is going to be disappear. It's going to disappear. So um, lots of investors are going to be less stringent on geographical location of the company. Um, it will be, again, which is true to always have been. It's about the team and the founders and the product. But it's just historically we know that, you know, yeah, that's great. We have a great team and a product. But, you know, I want you to be in uh, within a, a, an hour's drive from where I live, which is uh, you know, ridiculous. But, but that is going to change positively. Mm -hmm. And I also think actually for talent acquisition, it's positive changes um, because remote working is going to be the norm. It's going to be acceptable by everybody. Uh, everybody is finding their own way of making it work. Um, studies have shown that people are even more productive when it's set up correctly. Um, so as a, as a company now looking for, for, for people in, in our field of data science and uh, software and hardware engineers, I really don't care where they sit. You know, I have told our recruiters, you know, that, you know, you can, if the best guy sits in Buenos Aires, we will find a way to, you know, work with him and, and get him on board and, you know, uh, still manage to see each other once a quarter physically when, when that is allowed for. But um, I think it's a net positive for both funding and talent acquisition what's happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So just to wrap it up, I would like to thank you very much and of course hope to see you soon again around a drink as we did uh, in the beginning of the year just before yeah. the lockdown so yeah. and wishing all the best and please stay safe and looking forward to hearing from you furthermore thank you steve thank, thank you, you. Bye. Thank you. Okay.